Thank you to our brass ensemble. So nice to have them uh, with us in worship today. Well, almost exactly a year ago, uh, one of my sons and I took a kind of bucket list trip to Arizona. Uh, we had both already seen the Grand Canyon, so we had a couple other things we really wanted to see. And top on the list was a place called Monument Valley. It's this uh, location with some uh, spectacular rock formations near the border of Utah and Arizona. Anybody been to this particular spot? Oh, a lot of you have been, so you know what I'm talking about. You might better recognize this view, which is the road heading into Monument Valley called uh, Route 163, I think coming in from the north. And by the way, those rock formations in the distance are 12 miles away from the place the picture is taken. Just a spectacular uh, place in our country. Well, uh, my son and I... Um, Went to that spot and because actually you might this is the road that was made famous. I meant to say this by the movie Forrest Gump because that's, <laughs> that's where Forrest stopped running. If you've seen that movie, so that's where people recognize it from. So naturally, my son and I wanted to go to that place to uh, get a picture from that spot. So we did, and it was fun to see. And we went back to our hotel. Well, later that night after dinner, when it was dark, we decided to go back out to that spot, drive the 12 miles back out there just to see uh, what, it, what the sky looked like at night. We were lucky to have a really clear night. And so my son pointed his camera at the sky, and he took this picture, which is the Milky Way. I've taken my, with his own camera. So we, we were so uh, overwhelmed by this sight, how beautiful it was. We laid down, both of, we laid down on our backs in the middle of that road, right there, for like a half an hour. It was cold, but there were no cars in the middle of the night. And you could see like 12 miles each direction, so if you saw lights pop up, you'd get off the road. But we watched that because it was just so amazing, and we just let ourselves be overwhelmed with the, with the beauty and the um, vastness of the night sky. Now, I would guess that most of you have had a moment like that. You see Niagara Falls for the first time, or you see the Grand Canyon, or you see the Milky Way. And I think most of us have two sort of simultaneous reactions at that moment. On the one hand, we feel very small in the face of a, a, a specter like that. Yet at the same time, we sense the presence of something or someone so overwhelming, so big, so full of what we can only call glory that we can hardly help but respond with awe and wonder. And that's where we begin today. We're in a series called songs of the soul from the book of psalms we've looked at so far psalm 1 which was a psalm of blessing psalm 8 which was a psalm of wonder psalm 42 a song song of lament or sadness and then last week psalm 10 a song of justice and today we look at psalm 24 which we're calling a song of glory now just by way of introduction psalm 24 is the third in a trilogy of what are called messianic psalms Psalm 22 uh, shows us that the Messiah is one who will suffer. It's where the one that Jesus quoted from the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 23 tells us that the Messiah will be like our shepherd. It begins with the famous words, The Lord is my shepherd. And Psalm 24 tells us the, that the Messiah is the king of glory. Now, this psalm had a specific occasion. Uh, it was written to be sung uh, as the Ark of the Covenant, I'll say more about that in just a minute, was being carried through the gates of Jerusalem toward the sanctuary of the tabernacle or would eventually be the great temple in Jerusalem. Now the backstory here is that the Ark of the Covenant was the most holy possession that Israel had. It symbolized the very presence and power of Yahweh, Jehovah God. And God had given very specific instructions about how the Ark of the Covenant was to be handled and how it was to be moved because it represented everything about God's holiness. For example, it was never to be touched by human hands. Rather, it was carried on poles that were slipped through golden rings at each corner of the Ark. And it was carried specifically by a group of men called the Levites who had been trained specifically for this holy purpose. Now, if we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6, King David needs to go rescue the ark from the Philistines because they've captured it. So he gets it back and he puts it on an ox cart to, be, to carry it back to Jerusalem. And then when one of the oxen stumble, a man named Uzzah reaches out his hand to steady the ark. 
and to keep it from falling, but he touches it with his hand, and immediately he is struck dead on the spot. I'm going to come back to that story in just a minute. But beyond the, the immediate purpose uh, of this psalm, it also has a prophetic nature to it. That, in that, it points to the coming of the Messiah. And for us as Christians, it points to the coming of Jesus. So that is the backdrop. Let me read our way through Psalm 24. I'll make a few comments along the way, and then we'll break it down and look at what God teaches us today. Psalm 24 says, A Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's. I'm going to stop there and point out that whenever you see in the Old Testament the word Lord written in all caps, it means something specific. It means that's the Hebrew word Yahweh, or what we would say Jehovah. It's the personal name of God. There were other words that the psalm writer could have used for God here, but he uses the specific name for God, Yahweh, and he uses it throughout the psalm. So every time you see the word Lord, it's going to be capitalized. That's what it means. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to, that, to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. Now, the meaning of this little word Selah is somewhat mysterious. Uh, most scholars think it points to a kind of musical rest, sort of a time to reflect on what was just being said or sung. Verse 7, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Now, this is a call and response, kind of like what we did today in our responsive reading. The leader says one line, O lift up your heads, O gates, and then the people sing the other line, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And it goes like this for the rest of the psalm. Verse 8, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Now this psalm addresses three questions. First, who is the King of glory? Second, who can approach the King of glory? And third, how or when will the King of glory come? come. Now first, who is the king of glory? When one of our boys, not the same one that went with me to Arizona, but another one, was very, very young, he developed um, a fascination for whales. I think it all began with the movie Free Willy. Remember see that movie years ago? Well, he watched all of them. I think there were like three or, three or four of them. But he came to love whales. He loved Willy. He loved killer whales especially. Orcas were his favorite. And by the time he was four or five years old, he would read little books on whales, and he got to know, uh, the, he could tell you the characteristics of, of dozens of kinds of whales. You know, killer whales, and right whales, and sperm whales, and blue whales, and beluga whales, and narwhals, and all kinds of whales. And he just loved whales, but killer whales were his favorite. He had a whole tub of little plastic killer whales then that he would take into the bathtub and play. This was his favorite little, we still have this in our attic. This was his favorite killer whale. Well, we were taking a family vacation one time to visit my brother and his family in Ohio. And at that time, there was a SeaWorld in Cleveland. I don't think it exists anymore. But we thought, let's take, let's take our whole family to SeaWorld. He can see a real killer whale. He can see Shamu, the famous killer whale, at SeaWorld. So we went to SeaWorld. And the first thing I did was when we went and walked into the park, we went straight to the, this tank, this holding tank, where they kept Shamu in, before the show. So we went to this tank. And I picked my little boy up to look over the edge of the tank to see his first real-life killer whale. And his eyes got really big, and he got really quiet. And then this sort of awestruck little voice, he said, Daddy, it's really big. <laughs> and it struck me as cute, but it struck me as, oh, of course. If all he knew was this, this to him was a killer whale, then that was a pretty awesome thing to see. See, no one gazes at the Milky Way or sees the Grand Canyon or looks at Shamu, the great killer whale, and says, wow, I'm awesome. 
We don't do that, right? We look at the Milky Way or the Grand Canyon or Shamu and we think, oh, wow, the one who made this, the one who created this, the one who dreamed this up is really, really big. The word glory in the Old Testament comes from the Hebrew word kabod, which carries the fundamental meaning of weight or heaviness or splendor, magnificence. That was just overwhelming. And this song starts with two things about the king of glory. First, the king of glory is the creator. This is the creator. Psalm 24 begins with, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The earth is the Lord's. Now, most of us here today hear that, that, that sentence, and we kind of nod our heads. Well, yeah, sure. We, I, I get it. We believe he, he created everything. Okay. But there's something interesting here. It has to do with that word for Lord that I explained earlier. The all caps Lord, which means Yahweh, the personal name of God, he gave to Moses, I am that I am. This is significant. See, in the ancient world, each people group and each cultural group had their own God or God, small g. That's how the world was. The Canaanites had Baal, the god of fertility. The Philistines had Dagon, who had a, the body of a fish and the uh, uh, and the, and, but with human head and hands. The Moabites had Chemosh, the fearsome god to whom they may have offered child sacrifices. So there are all kinds of gods in the ancient world. So when David says the earth is not the generic word for God, but the specific personal name of Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of the Israelites, and the fullness thereof, the world, and all who, those who dwell therein, he's making a specific and definitive statement. He's saying everything... The earth and all who live on the earth belong not to Baal, not to Dagon, not to Chemosh, or any other gods of the ancient world. They belong to one specific God who has a name. His name is Yahweh. Why? Because Yahweh, the eternally existent one, the glorious one, has created all there is. So who is the king of glory? His name is Yahweh. And everything, the earth and every person who lives on the face of the earth, belongs to him. It's the first thing David says, right in the first line. Secondly, this psalm addresses the question, who can approach the king of glory? Who can approach the king of glory? Way back when I was in college, uh, one summer, my dad helped me get a job with uh, a guy who was an electrical contractor who went to our church. Um, and the job he got me was technically called an electrician's apprentice, but it's really just a gopher. I just helped get, get tools and stuff because I knew nothing about electricity. But one of the first days I was on this job, this experienced electrician I was helping out was up on a ladder leaning against the outside of a building. And he, uh, he was working on some wiring on the side of the building and he hollered down for me to go get a tool out of his truck. So I went to get the tool and as I had my back turned to him, I heard a popping sound and then kind of a yelp of pain. I stopped and turned around, and he had, he had fallen off the ladder. Uh, he was lying on the ground, and his face, he had blood coming out of his mouth. So I ran back to him, and what had happened was he had grabbed hold of a wire that was live, and the shock of the electricity knocked him off the ladder and caused him to bite, almost bite all the way through his tongue. Now, he sort of wrote it off uh, and said, well, that's what I get for uh, he's having the blood. That's what I get for, for working too fast, he said. But it was terrifying to me because I didn't know anything about electricity. And that guy did, and it did that to him. So to this very day, I have this respect for and fear of electricity. I mean, I go to change a light bulb at my house, which I did just yesterday, and I'm nervous. I turn off all the switches, go down to the basement, shut off all the breakers. You laugh, but... Have you seen what it can do? It's powerful stuff. See, I understand that I shouldn't approach electricity frivolously or carelessly. It's powerful. You approach electricity on its terms, not your own. That's a bit what the holiness of God is like. David says, verse 3, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. See, I think David has holiness 
on his mind here. I think he's thinking about the Ark of the Covenant. He's thinking about Uzzah, this man who reached out and touched the Ark in violation of God's clear instructions. Now, God wasn't being cruel to Uzzah. He was just being holy. That's what God is. I think he's thinking about two brothers named Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10. They're sons of Aaron. They're nephews of Moses himself, who the Bible says offered strange fire to the Lord. That is, they offered worship on their terms, not on God's terms, and they were consumed by the holiness of God. So David says, who shall stand in his holy place? Who's qualified to approach the king of glory? And then he mentions four requirements. He says, he who has clean hands. Now this refers to outward deeds and actions. One who always does that which is right and never does that which is wrong. Then he says, one who has a pure heart. This refers to the inner life, inward motivations, inward intentions. It means having a clear or transparent heart. It means honesty before God. And then he says, he who does not lift his soul to that which is false. This is the question of worship in the context of the psalm. It means he who does not offer his soul to the pagan gods of the surrounding cultures. In our world, it might mean he who does not offer his greatest devotion to that which is not God. Maybe money or maybe work or maybe status. And then fourthly, he says, he does not, does not swear deceitfully. This is the question of truth. So in summary, who can approach the king of glory? One who always does what is right. One who always has pure motives. One who does not offer devotion to that which is not God. One who is not captive to the winds of our culture. And here's the problem. And you can see it already. We want to have clean hands, but we do not have clean hands. We want to have pure hearts, but we do not have pure hearts. In small ways and in big ways, we have lifted our hearts and our souls to that which is false. So the answer to the question, who can approach the king of glory, is no one. No one. Psalm 14.3 says, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. So how are we made clean? How are we made pure enough to approach the God who is holy? And this is the great story of the Bible. The Old Testament tells us that the people of Israel tried to do this and were instructed to do this by observing what's called the Day of Atonement. That is one day a year when a high priest would go into the most holy place, offer a blood sacrifice to cover, to atone for the sins of the people to make them clean again. And the priest had to do this over and over again, year after year. We get to the New Testament, and now we're told that Jesus, our great high priest, does this once for all. Hebrews chapter 9. He, Jesus, did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse, make clean our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. And because we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, Hebrews 4 tells us, let us therefore approach God's throne of grace, approach his holiness, approach the king of glory with confidence, with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So the Bible's telling us that through Jesus, God has made a way for us to approach the king of glory. In Christ, we are made clean again. Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. So in Christ, we are made new. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, 
the newest here. So in Christ, our hands are made clean. In Christ, our hearts are made pure. In Christ, we are restored into relationship with the King of glory. In Christ, we are born again. The third thing we see in this psalm, the third question that's addressed is, when or how will the King of glory come? Back to Psalm 24, verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Selah. Now the picture here is of a victorious and mighty king returning from battle. Notice the imagery. The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. See, in our world, in most of our experience, if there is a war, the kings of our world, heads of state, presidents, prime ministers, and so forth, they send out young men and women to fight the battle, right? They stay in their palaces, they stay in their capitals, they stay home, and they send the young people out to fight. Not, not so in the ancient world. In the ancient world, the king led the troops in the battle. The king was the warrior out in the front lines. The king is the one who rode in front. So here the king of glory has won a great battle. He's defeated the enemy and is returning, preparing, and approaching the city. So the song was written calling the people to be prepared to receive their king with joy and celebration and devotion. Now what's this all about? As I said before, this is a messianic psalm. It's looking toward the day. It's written for a specific purpose, the coming of the ark into the city. But it's looking toward the day when the Messiah, the promised one, the Savior, would return to the city and be their king, their victorious king. And we believe that this ancient psalm is pointing toward Jesus as the coming king of glory. So the king of glory comes in three ways. How does Jesus come as the king of glory? First, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. All the gospels tell us that on what we call Palm Sunday, that we'll celebrate a few just a few weeks from now, tell us that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a young donkey to symbolize he was the fulfillment of prophecy. He was coming as king. We're told that people lined the streets and they carried the palm branches and they threw their coats on the ground and they sang, Hosanna, Hosanna to he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were welcoming their king. But Jesus came as a different kind of king. He came as the king who was going to offer himself as the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. Secondly, he will come as king of glory at the end of all things, at what we call the second coming. Listen to these words from Revelation chapter 19. The apostle John writes, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on them that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now this is an apocalyptic vision, an ap apocalyptic image meant to tell us that at the end of all things, in the timing of God Almighty, Jesus will come again, not on a donkey coming in humility, but on a white horse coming to conquer, coming as the God of all judgment and all authority. He will come to rule the promise of Scripture. <clears throat> Thirdly, the King of glory, Jesus, comes to us comes to our hearts. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So, let's try to put all this together. Who is the King of glory? The King of glory is God. 
And he has a name, Yahweh, Jehovah, creator of all things, the God of all glory. And as Christians, we believe Jesus is God in the flesh, God incarnate, God who is with us. So Jesus is the king of glory. Who can approach the king of glory? Who can approach the one who is holy? Who can approach with clean hands and a pure heart? No one. No one. But the good news is, even though we cannot approach him, because we are not holy, he has come to us. When and how will the king of glory come? He rode into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago on a donkey to offer himself as the king who suffers. He will come again as the king of kings to judge and rule at the end of all things. And he comes to us today by his spirit to knock on the doors of our hearts. Now, two things here. We need to be, get very clear. Jesus is the king of glory. King is not a word with which we are very familiar in our culture. King is not a word with which we are terribly comfortable as a culture. King. Not, he comes not as a consultant, not as a life coach, not as a personal genie to give us the things we most want in life. He comes as king. That means he has all the authority. Everything that is belongs to him, including you and me. Our hearts, our lives, our decisions, our families, everything. He's king. We have to get, get that clear. Secondly, our hearts have doors or gates, as it were. He's the king of glory, but he doesn't come barging in. He doesn't just come and take by force what is his. He knocks. To me, that's pretty amazing. I think if I were king of glory, I'd just take what was mine. He doesn't. He knocks. And the doorknobs are on our side of the door. He knocks. We must open. And when we open the door, he has the authority to make clean again. He can make pure again. And then, as a response, we surrender to him as king. We worship him as king. We serve him as king. I don't know about you, but at our house, we keep our front door locked. Almost all the time, we keep our front door locked. We may have to leave other stuff open, but we keep the front door locked. And we have a little, a, a little note that we've taped to the little window there that says, no solicitors, please. Right? Do you have one of those? You know, we just don't, we just, we, in other words, we don't want someone, just don't knock on our door. Don't come. Don't sell us something. Don't come. The exception is the, the kids who come selling their cookies and stuff, but we'll do that. But no solicitors. You know, I, I was thinking about that. We kind of do that with our hearts. Right? We lock them from the inside. We want to stay in control. And we post a little sign, no, no soliciting, please. In other words, this is mine. Everything on this side is mine. You can have everything out there, but on this side, it's all mine. This ancient psalm tells us that the king of glory is holy, and no one can approach him. It tells us the king of glory has defeated the enemy, and we know the enemy to, be, enemy to be sin and death. The king of glory, though, has come to us in his grace to make clean and pure again. And the king of glory knocks. He knocks. He knocks. So, the psalm says, lift up your heads, open the gates, that the king of glory may come in. That's the good news. Open the gates that the King of Glory may come in. Will you bow with me now as we close? Lord, we thank you for this ancient song of worship. And today we bow our hearts before your glory and your holiness. We acknowledge that our hands are not clean. Our hearts are not pure. We're not clean enough and pure enough to approach you on our own terms. And so we throw open the gates of our hearts and we invite you to make us clean again. May we receive you as king. 
our only king, and may we serve you. In Jesus' name we pray.